YouTube that I kind of suggested last week, if you're up in the middle of the night, you did. Yeah, you can find prayers for whatever you're going through at any time of the night. It's like 3 a.m. prayers, 1 a.m. prayers. It's like I'm hitting every hour on the hour right now. So it's really good. Uh, but I've kind of been pressing into um, to these prayers. And what I like is that they're kind of in line of what the message is going to be today. Um, but first, I, I do want to give God thanks. And our offering to him, our worship to him is 24-7. It's, it's not just financially supporting the church. It's our every, every day, the way we act, the way we live is supposed to be in worship to God, right? It's our reasonable service. So I know we come in here sometimes and it's like, you know, we'll just let the worship go for a while because, you know what, 35 minutes, we get to come in here. I mean, I go for hours if I, if I could, you know. That's why I really want everybody to be here for that uh, praise and worship service on the 5th. Because it's an hour of just prayer and praise. Um, we, uh, I'll give you an update on the finances. This is the first year we've really had any struggles. Um, we've been, like every year we're in the positive well, look, I know it's tough out there for everybody, but I thank you because, you know, we're not in any danger or anything. We've been here 10 years, and we'll be here until the Lord goes, and then we're out, right? The trumpet, and we're out. So, um, but thank you because the um, support you give is, is great. Somebody dropped off some waters this week. Any little thing that you do helps. And I think there's a slide for the little things. Thank you. Uh, besides your tithes and offerings, uh, you know, a small water bottles from Costco. If everybody brought just one, we'd have enough for the next couple of months. Uh, you know, other things, kitchen bags, paper towels, distilled water, healthy snacks for the kids. These, these things do help. The little things add up, especially when pg and is raising their rates again. Yeah. It took my house, and now you want to raise the rates. So uh, I'll be praying for them. <laughs> Not the people that work for pg and &E, It's like the higher powers. Um, but uh, you can give many different ways to Rock of Life. Uh, the website, there's the QR codes. There's Venmo, which is pretty popular. Tidely does charge a small um, a fee. Uh, Tidely Church app. If you don't know what that is, just go on your, your app store and uh, just type in T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y and you type in Rocket Life Fellowship and our app comes up. There's the Bible on there. The messages are on there. There's, I need to update it, but there's pictures and I think Jody comes up on the first page, I think. So it's kind of cool. Her 27 kids. And, uh, <laughs> and now grandkids. Yeah. So... Um, uh, so it's really, it's really. Uh, I appreciate the support you give. We were just short by a couple of grand last month. It wasn't horrible, and uh, we take the biblical principle of storing up the storehouses for the tough times, and we did that. So thank God we're okay. But I just want to thank you for your obedience and supporting Rocket Life. All right, let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, that my voice holds out. I <laughs> thank you for. The healing spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, God. But most of all, we thank you that we get to come in here and hear your word. We get to be with fellow uh, brothers and sisters, and we get to come in your house, which is called the house of prayer. We get to worship you, Lord. There's so many blessings that we take for granted that we're here. And I just give you the praise and glory for this word, that may it be exactly what you want us to hear today and encourage us so that we're stronger walking out than when we walked in. Amen? Amen. 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 Give the Lord some praise. All right, so uh, last week I asked everybody a question. It was like, like, what's the inspiration of your life, right? So if somebody said, hey, what's the inspiration in your life? And we all want to be on the same page, right? So if you look at the epistles, even the, the gospels, but like the letters that written by Peter and Paul and James and, uh, you know, and, and everyone else basically, but Peter, Paul, and James especially, they have this theme going. And this theme is, the church needs to be on the same page. The church needs to be like, reminded constantly. And if you look at like uh, Corinthians and Ephesians and Thessalonians and even James, there's this constant theme of, hey, church, stay together. Stay focused. Separate from the world. So there, even there's a lot of repetition about warnings about you know, false doctrines and people that might come in your church and, and, and try to separate you and, and lay down some false facts and distort who Jesus really is. And, and they're especially always telling us, like, stay focused, stay in unity, be aware, separate from the church, don't be deceived. And that theme runs constantly through the New Testament. You think they're trying to tell us something, right? It's because we need to be unified as a church. We need to be on the same page. So when I asked last week what inspires you and, and who inspires you, 
That way, we can all collectively say, you know what, I'm, I'm inspired by the Word of God. I'm inspired by the Holy Spirit's move in my life. I'm, the, the way He lays out the Word and He reminds me of things so that we can be unified. So the focus again is, and I know it sounds basic at times, at times, but sometimes you need to like really dig deep into the basics of what the Bible is trying to tell us. Especially during the podcast that we've been doing lately, and you read the news, and there's so much division. There's so much hate. There's so much lies. There's so much people that have obviously decided not to follow God, and they're living it out. There's such great division. It's, it's getting more evident and clear. The more I read the news stories, I'm reading even more news than I did because I want to know what I'm talking about. People are refusing to honor Father God. They will not follow Jesus. And they'd rather lead themselves through life and be their own God than have the Holy Spirit lead them. And you could just read it. You can see it. I mean, I experience it when I go out. Just try driving around Chico. Oof. Right? Unfortunately, too many people are rebelling against the Creator. I have a couple of scriptures for you. Revelations 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. And Romans 1.20 says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God has made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities his eternal power, his divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yet, a lot of people do. That's also a really big challenge to the believers. We're not supposed to be like the world. We're not supposed to act like them, talk like them, be like them. It comes down to Awareness of God, but people are still denying the truth. People can't see that this world, it's not it. This is temporary. It's not about this world. So if, if we were going to ask you a question like, what is like the main thing in your life, that you, how you live? How, how do you live your life? That's going to be the question for today. So we can all be unified. How do you live your life? What is your life about? What, what, are, what is our role as believers when we come across people that just flat out deny God? They don't care. It's a bit of a process, but let me, let me go through this a little bit. In Matthew 22, the Sadducees, they tried to tra trap Jesus, saying that, that, it was, uh, that they didn't believe he was the Messiah. So they try to trap him. And they always do in those gotcha questions. You ever see the news nowadays when they're interviewing somebody, it's always kind of a gotcha question. They try to do the same thing to Jesus, uh, trying, to contradict, trying to get him to contradict God's word, and it failed. So the Pharisees gave it a shot. In Matthew 22, 37, 40, Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said to him, and we should all know this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. God bless you. Okay, so love God with all our heart, with all our soul and mind. And Old Testament says strength. So paraphrasing just a little bit. Our lives are supposed to be a reflection of our relationship with God. We're supposed to be ambassadors of Christ. When people see us, how we act, how we talk, how we walk, how we interact with people, they should see a reflection of our relationship with God. And that reflection of our relationship with God is to reflect on how we love others, and how we deal with an unbelieving world. I know it's frustrating. I know it's hard. I probably back in the day, I repented and I said a few times, just wait till you get to heaven you're, gonna, you're in for it. Anybody ever do that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> they're, yeah, yeah, they're denying them now. But just wait. You know, there's fiery hell coming down. Like, I want to be there when the Lord says, I don't know you because I had that in me. That's not what it means when it says, love your neighbor. <laughs> it's not what it means. 
But what are we supposed to do as believers when we're around people that refuse to believe in God? And we even have loved ones, family members, friends. And as much as you love them and you talk to them and you tell them the truth, they just look at you and go, no. What are we supposed to do about that? Matthew 28, 19, 20 says, Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Matthew 28. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's a lot about obeying the commandments there. See, the challenge is, that's important. The reason why it says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you is because he's telling us the reflection that we have and how we honor God and how we live our lives is going to make a really big difference when you try to go out and make disciples. I just flashback. I remember working in nightclubs and I'm like 20 years old, 22 years old. I'm working in nightclubs in that environment not really being a, a godly person, but yet talking about God, people must have thought, thought I was just a hypocrite. You know, I, just because of my lifestyle at the time. It's really difficult to tell people about Jesus if your life doesn't reflect that relationship with Jesus. And there's a lot there too in Matthew 28, 19. And I'm, I'm going to give you the bookmark that you can turn to now if you have your Bibles or electronics. We're going to go to John 14. And we're going to read a lot of John 14. Because in Matthew 28, there's a lot of talk about Father God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? Because I know we've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit lately. And I, I was pretty blunt. You know, unfortunately, I've been in a couple of churches that the only thing they ever talked about is the Holy Spirit of Santa Claus. All he is is give you things, give you, give you, give you. But they don't have a relationship with all the things that the Holy Spirit is. So we'll be touching on some of this. There are some Bible verses of John that basically explain how we connect with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're going to focus on that. In John 14, verses 15 to 31. Jesus is promising a helper, the Holy Spirit. John, this is John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. That goes back, just stopping right there. If you love me, obey my commandments. That's in Matthew 28, it says, teach the new disciples to obey all the commandments. And then verse 16 says, and I will ask the Father to give you another advocate or helper who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. Highlight that. He leads me, leads me into all truth. Highlight the word leads. The world cannot receive him because they're not looking for him. They don't recognize him. They don't recognize the Holy Spirit. They may know about Father God. They may have heard about Jesus, but they don't recognize the Holy Spirit. I've had people have, have had Holy Spirit experiences. They sense something. They feel something. They come into church and a song hits them. A word hits them. They talk to somebody and they have this moment and they let it go. They don't hang on to that Holy Spirit moment. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he, underline the word, lives. He lives with you now and later will be in you. And then it says, verse 18, No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me. He's talking about himself, Jesus. But you will see me. Underline the word. Since I live, you also will live. Live, 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 live. live. All throughout the scriptures, I think we're missing this one word. Live. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments, again, and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them and I will love them. 
and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Iscariot, but the other one, it's Thaddeus actually, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? That's a good question. Why are you revealing, you're revealing yourself to the believers and, and not the unbelievers? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and he will come and make our home with each of them. Here we go. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you things that now, while I'm still with you, but when the Father sends the Advocate, the Helper, as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything, remind you of everything I have told you. He will teach you everything. I'm leaving you with the gift. Peace of mind and heart. Anybody ever really focus on that before? I'm leaving you with a gift. A peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give you. The world can't offer you peace. They can't offer you a true heart. So don't be troubled or afraid. It seems pretty obvious. God's mentioning quite a few times that people are going to deny Him. They're not going to love Him. And that we need to strive to, to love God. And if we show that love by keeping His commandments. And we, we do this for His glory. We'll be given a lot of pushback when we try to tell people about Jesus. I watch a lot of the uh, um, evangelists and the guys that go out to, uh, guys and women that go out to colleges and, and these events where they're answering questions from people that are atheists. And um, they're pretty tough questions. There's a lot of persecution. They're not really nice at times, but we've got to love them even more. People get up there, if God's so great, why does he have all these diseases? And if God's so great, why is there all these wars? And, you know, they blame God. They blame a God they don't believe in, that they say doesn't exist. If God doesn't exist, all the troubles that we have, it's our, it's our fault. And God does exist, and guess what? It's still our fault. Loving people isn't always easy. I'm going to get to the point in a minute. 1 Peter 3.13. 1 Peter 3.13. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you, will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer... Always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Here's a big line coming up pretty soon if you have a highlighter you remember really well. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live. There it is again, because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Start paying attention. When we read Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians, James, start noticing those words, life and live. They're everywhere. The challenge God's trying to tell us a lot of times, and it seems really basic, is how are you living your life? What do you live for? So I'm going to bring it into focus now. As so many people in the world pull away from God, we're to draw near to God. It ain't always easy because there's a lot of tough times we go through. I get it. But the tougher time is, the more we have to press into our relationship with God. Evaluate how we're living our life. Three reasons why because it matters to God how we live our life. It matters to ourselves and to the people around us. How we live, how we address this world and their unbelieving and their persecution and, and 
They're walking away from God? How do we live? How does this matter? It matters to God, first of all, because if we love him, we obey his commandments. It matters to ourselves because it's our testimony. It's, it's how we affect people. It's, it's whether or not we fill ourselves full of faith or we, are we filling ourselves full of fear. And the people around us, they see this. They see how we live. It matters to them. It matters to our family, our friends, strangers. God is constantly asking us, the believers in his church, his children, to be on the same page. To know the word so well that when they ask us certain questions, the answers are all the same. What's the inspiration of your life? Power of the Holy Spirit, his word. The word. I live my life according to God's word. That's my inspiration to get through this world. We're to be unified as his people and separate from the world. Not to let any of those influences seep into our lives and mess stuff up. It disturbs our dedication to God, our relationship with Jesus, and how we live led by the Holy Spirit. And Peter is saying that how he lives makes a difference not only to us, but the people around us. He's not saying, hey, protect your, your testimony. He's saying, hey, by the way, the way you live and how you conduct yourself, people are going to come up to you and ask you, what's the reason for your faith? This isn't a, this isn't a verse in, in 1 Peter where he's saying to go out and make the disciple part, where you walk up to somebody and say, hey, can I tell you about Christ? Can I tell you about Jesus? No, this is a section that says, hey, you live in a life for Christ. People are going to ask you, hey, what's different about you? How are you handling that disease? I, I don't get it. All the stuff you're going through at work and financial problems, how are you keeping, why do you always have this joy? People are going to ask you why you have faith, and are we ready to answer? Sometimes we're not. It comes out, no offense, it, me, it just comes out shallow. Oh, I just put my faith in God. What does that mean? It says, explain the reason for your faith. It says, always be ready to explain it. Don't give them a sound bite. Don't just say, oh, you know, I'm a Christian. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so I just noticed, you know, uh, at your job, you know, there's a lot of problems, a lot of work and all that, and everybody's always kind of, you know, treating you kind of rough and all that because, you know, you say you have faith. How are you handling How do you do that? What, what keeps you going? Well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Be ready to explain it. And I'm actually going to give you Three things that we all should be on the same page about. So we're going to go deeper on what it means when Peter says others will be ashamed when they see what a good life we live. We're going to go through that too. Not only, we, not only are we called to share the gospel verbally, we're to live out the gospel. Because sometimes people see you more than they hear you. We may think that standing on the corner... And shouting, you sinners, you're going to burn, may be a good idea sometimes. <laughs> Somebody on the podcast a couple weeks ago said that the time for hellfire and brimstone messages is over. I don't really believe that because it's, it's how you do it in a, gentle, in a gentle way. I can definitely tell somebody, hey, look, here's your two options. You can spend eternity with God or you can spend eternity without God. But let me explain what that means. It means this eternal fire that's never quenched. It's this eternal anxiety and stress. And, oh, my God, what did I do, Lord? I turned, I had this chance. People told me I did the gnashing of teeth and anxiety. And you're just going, oh, what have I done? And nobody's going to tell you it's going to get better tomorrow. Nobody's going to tuck you in. The sun doesn't come out tomorrow. None of that stuff's going to happen. Nobody's going to tell you it's going to be better. Just don't worry. Just, you know, it's not like that. You have eternal separation from anything that's good. Eternal separation from God. That's hell. God sent his son to save you from that. All you have to do is just turn from this life, repent of the things that have hurt him, confess with your tongue, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you'll be saved. God has something for you far beyond what this world could offer you. He loves you that much. He just wants his children with him forever. That's pretty hellfire and brimstone there. 
So let me give you a few things. Even if you don't go out evangelizing, even I've had some people tell me, I'm just not an evangelist. I just, I'm just, I just, I'm not comfortable sharing my faith. Okay. So you don't do it verbally. Here's the question. How are you living your life? What is your life about? See, we influence people with our faith just by how we live. Our faith in striving to follow God's commandments, people take notice of us. When people ask about our faith, we need to respond. And if they don't listen, Peter is saying, they may not listen, but they're still going to watch you. So we can take the scriptures and can we make this game plan? Here we go. Three things. Write it down, bookmark it, highlight it. Three things. When people ask you, how are you living your life? I don't, what's, I don't get it. We honor God. We honor Father God. We follow Jesus. And we're led by the Holy Spirit. I think there's a slide for that. Thank you. We live our life by honoring God, following Jesus, and we're led by the Holy Spirit. Those are the basics. It's that simple. There's lots of details in there. That's it. We want to live our life honoring God, following Jesus, led by the Spirit. I'm going to give you the Bible verses. Honor God. Psalm 86.11. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. That I may live, there's that word, live, according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart so I may honor you. Remember when the word says he's going to grant us peace and heart? Grant me purity of heart. That means, Lord, let my desires, let my feelings, everything I do, Lead me in a way that I honor you, that I live my life with a pure heart, that I don't live with a bunch of regrets and sin. I want to turn away from the sin. I want to repent. And I just want this pure heart that the only, the only thing I want to do is just love you and worship you. So I honor you. Follow Jesus. Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. So if you're on, the, on, on Facebook and you're watching, it was Psalm 86.11 and Colossians 2.6 to follow Jesus. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith, did you notice that word? Lives? Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. There's definitely a pattern here. Over and over in the letters, you're going to see that word, how you live, your life, your life, your life, how you live, how you live in your life. When people see how you live, they're going to come and ask you about it. How you live honors God. How you live shows whether or not you follow Jesus or not. Be led by the spirits, the third one. Galatians 5, 16, 18. Obviously, these aren't the only scriptures, but these are the three ones that I know God wants us to focus on. Galatians 5, 16 to 18. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. So you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The other pattern in this is that how you live your lives, honoring God, following Jesus, being led by the Holy Spirit, starts to show the separation we're to have from this world. When it says, obey God's commandments, not the demands of this world, right? So, so do what pleases God, not what pleases your flesh, not your sinful nature. Separate. All three of these Bible verses state how we are to live. And those three things that we're to strive for every single day, if those were the three things that we could all say to people when they ask us how you live, that opens up a whole new conversation. Rod, Rod, so all the stuff you're going through at work and, you know, leading prayer on, on calls that you never thought you'd do before, right? People ask you, Rod, what, how, how are you getting through all the stuff at your job and all I, Well, first of all, I live to honor God. You know, I, I, I follow Jesus, and no matter what happens at work and the tough times, I, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. Wow, that says a lot. That opens up a great conversation. It builds your Christian character, 
and your integrity. I'm going to tell you a couple of true stories. I might have said this once before, but bear with me. A couple of true stories. People see how you live, especially when you're a pastor. This didn't happen to me, <laughs> but true story. There's this pastor. He takes over a church. It's a new church. He's only been there a couple, three weeks or so. And uh, he's starting to meet his congregation. He gives a couple sermons. He's preaching about integrity and character. And during one of the weekdays, he goes into a store to buy some groceries. And he's in the store. He just comes up a couple of bags, goes up to the checker, pays his money. He gets his change back. He starts walking back to the car, and he's putting his change away, and he looks at it, and he goes, oh, there's an extra 20 here. They gave me back too much money. He walks back into the store, walks back to the cashier, and says, hey, hey, excuse me, sorry, sorry. You gave me an extra $20 on accident. And she looks at him and goes, no, I didn't. He goes, yeah, you did. I got the receipt. I saw it was obvious. You know, I gave you like 40. You gave me back 20-something. She goes, I didn't give you that 20 bucks on accident. I gave it to you on purpose. And she said, you know, I was in your church last week. I recognized you. I wanted to see if you practiced what you preached. True story. You know, he was going, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you led my life, Holy Spirit. That's, that, it. People will notice how you live. He honored God by being a faithful servant. He followed Jesus by having that integrity and having that ambassador of Christ feeling. And he's led by the Holy Spirit to do the right thing, to live in truth. This happened to me. I was in Subway a few years ago, and um, same thing happened to me. I got a sandwich. It must have been 10 years, because I haven't been to Subway in a long time. <laughs> but um, they gave me an extra $10. And it was really busy. I mean, it was really busy in there. And uh, you could tell that the, the cashier, she was really flustered. She's kind of stressed out. She's like, only two people. That's really crazy. So she gives me the money. And I went, oh, there's too much money. And as soon as she gave me the change, she walked away. Can I take your order? And um, she's really busy. So I looked at her. I said, excuse me, excuse me. And she didn't, she didn't really listen to me. I go, excuse me. And um, Everybody's looking at me like, oh, what do you want? We're trying to get an order. And I said, I said, you gave me $10 too much. And everybody in line, all their heads at the same time went, <laughs> they were shocked. Oh, I would have kept the $10. I could hear it. You know? And the girl goes, oh, 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 thanks, thanks. I'm sorry. Here's the thing about it. They were shocked that I said, you gave me $10 too much. So... But she, people noticed that, that reaction. They noticed that you live your life according to God. It, it was a testimony. You know, Peter's right. People probably notice how we live much more than if you don't really have the comfortability to talk to somebody about Christ. I went to a restaurant with a pastor a couple of weeks ago, another pastor in town, and we were about to say grace, and he looks at the waitress. He goes, you know, we're about to say grace. And uh, we usually pray for requests just for the Lord to you know, help us with some things. He goes, um, and we would honor him. Do you have a prayer request? I went to dinner with him twice. The first time the waitress goes, oh, no, my life's too crazy busy right now. You know, I know, that's okay. The second one said, you know, I'm going to school next week. I'm my last couple of days, I'm going to be traveling. I like a prayer for a safe trip, and I would do well in school. I'm going, great. So if you don't have that, and that you're uncomfortable with that, it, we should probably learn to be. But if you don't, be very conscious of how you live your life. Are you honoring God? Are you following Jesus? Are you led by the Holy Spirit? Are we keeping the commandments? Do we repent when we sin? Do we walk in forgiveness? Do we keep with faith, hope, and trust through the good times and the tough times? Are we walking this out? I definitely said this story before. So I worked at this company for like 20 years. And it was not a really good company. It was known for being kind of, you know, heathenous. It's a Fortune 20 company, actually. And um, 
I'd always be made fun of by this one guy. He'd always make fun of me. And um, he knew I was a Christian. And this is, whew, this is probably 20 years ago. Um, but I'd, I'd come back in on Monday morning. Hey, you went to church yesterday. Yeah, I went to church yesterday. He goes, well, just let me know a day in advance when Jesus is coming back. That way I give my life to God. You know, and then, you know, I'll be good. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't work that way, Bob. <laughs> so, but, uh, but he always make fun of me. Oh, there's Alfredo. And if he cussed, if he said a bad word in front of me, he'd go, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, because you've never said anything like that. I'd go, dude, you should have known the old Alfredo. I would have beat you under the table with those words. Always made fun of me. They, over the weekend, they were out the beach, and one of his sons almost drowned, ended up in the hospital. And I had an office in this this um, location. And I just remember, like, Monday afternoon, and it opened the door, come in, and it's this guy. He tells me what happens, and he, what does he ask me? Will you pray for my son? People will approach you. You don't have to say anything. But there's a little conviction here. Are you approachable? Are we approachable with our faith? Are we honoring God, following Jesus, being led by the Holy Spirit? Because it needs to be on top of our mind. This is how we live. This is it. This is how we live. <laughs> by the way, just on a side note, following somebody nowadays has a whole different meaning with social media, right? I did this a few years ago, and I did it again last night. I looked on Facebook. I only really post things on Facebook. You guys see my Facebook. Church, family, old pictures. I stopped doing all the other posting because it's just, it does just get you in trouble. Um, I thought I'd type in Jesus to see how many followers Jesus has. I know he had 12. <laughs> but I looked, up, I looked up Jesus, and I looked at all the different Jesus, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Savior, and I, I kind of X'd out the ones that were like the wrong Jesus, you know. But uh, the, the one I found the most was, was Jesus Christ Savior had 3.7 million followers. Some of the other Jesus had like 50,000, 100,000, total maybe 4 million followers on Facebook for Jesus. Taylor Swift has 80 million followers. <laughs> Do you know, anybody know who Cristiano Ronaldo is? Soccer player, he's the leader. 170 million followers. Jesus gets four. You think the world's following the wrong people? I'm going to give you a little bit of detail, then I'll, I'll close up. We must have this awareness 24-7 that we are called to honor Father God Follow Jesus and be led by the Spirit. If you go to the next slide, it's going to give you some detail. There you go. Here's some detail. Honor Father God. Obey His commandments. because That's what it says. So that we please Him, not ourselves. And then it says in these scriptures that I read that we do good works for His glory, not ours. We, I did, I, I, when I gave the 10 bucks back, I go, yeah, I'm so honest. <laughs> Here's your 10 bucks. <laughs> You know, you know what ruins it? When stuff like that happens, I see people, they go, you know, I could have kept that. <laughs> you know, they say things like that. The other day, my mom and I went to, top, you know, where did we go? Jack in the Box. They accidentally gave us two tacos extra. I think it was, that. I think it was an accident, yeah. I don't think they did it on purpose, otherwise I'm in trouble. So, but we get all the way home, and I'm going, oh, this doesn't sound right. It's, just, it's like, it's at least one extra taco. And I asked my mom, should I drive back and take it back? I kind of didn't know what to do. But, but I was thinking, it's one of those things where you look at this, and whenever I've, whenever I've had this experience and I've seen people, they will quickly say something that ruins it. I, I could have kept that 10 bucks. I could have kept the 20 bucks. Or they bring glory to themselves. Yeah, you know, I worked really hard for that award. You know, kind of stuff like that. <laughs> The other thing is we got to fear him with awe and respect, realize his power and majesty. I'm not afraid, afraid of God, but I fear him. I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want his wrath. I don't, we're going to get judgment, but I don't want the judgment where he pulls the lever. Sorry. 
you know, I don't know you. <laughs> I don't want, that's not the judgment I want. I know that was weird, sorry. <laughs> I don't think he really has a lever, though. <laughs> Yzma from Emperor's New Group had a lever. Okay. <laughs> okay, last few things. Follow Jesus. We got to know who Jesus is. We got to grow in our love for Jesus. I know you guys read the word, get to know Jesus, take on his characteristics, and love other people the way Jesus loves us. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's in Galatians 5. If you don't know, it's in Galatians 5. It basically says, hey, don't walk, don't walk the way the world does. Don't walk with hate and anger and jealousies and revelries and fits of wrath and you know, sexual morality. Don't walk like that. Walk the way the Spirit wants us to walk when we're led by the Holy Spirit. And then you read the fruit of the Spirit. You've got to feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I used to just walk through my life and not really think of how I was grieving the Holy Spirit with some of my decisions. I just go through life. It's just me. But now it's like, you know, you do one little thing, you're like, oh, you get that little conviction. You know, I, I go to the banks, you know, and I'll, I'll, they'll give me a pen to sign my check. I make sure I go, and here's your pen. You know, I'm not taking your pen. It's like, I didn't want to steal a pen. And have the discernment or the godly judgment and decisions we make. When you have a big decision to make, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Because that's what the scriptures said that we read. And the Holy Spirit will teach you, right, the things you've learned. Let me, I mean, this final thing. Let me close with this. We need to reach a point in our lives where we make a decision with great intent, with direct actions. Paul writes in Colossians 2, and we read this last week, I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and your church at Laodicea. This is Colossians 2, 1 through 10. And for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. He wants unity in the church. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lies hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I'm far away, this is the big part, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should. Almost every single time we read this in the New Testament, the epistles, the letters, of course the, you know, the gospels, but in the letters, Start noticing this, how many times we're challenged to live the way we should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Paul says, I see, I may not be with you, but I see and hear how you're living. And others around you will too, especially God. It starts by being a follower of Jesus. It's no coincidence that the very first words Jesus says when he's gathering disciples is, follow me. That's in Mark 8:34. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Amen? Amen. All right. So if somebody asks you, hey, how do you live your life? How are you doing? Hey, I honor God. I follow Jesus, and I'm led by the Holy Spirit. What inspires you? God's Word. His Holy Spirit. That's what inspires me. How do you live your life? How are you handling that, that physical problem? That financial problem, the relationship problem, how you dealing with getting through what you're going through, and why are you so success successful? You know, why, it's just, things seem to be going really well for you. Whatever you're at, I honor God, I follow Jesus, and I'm led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give Lord some praise.